Okay, so welcome to the afternoon session. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Manush uh, Shitharan from uh, Uber. Um, despite what it says, ETH Zurich there, but yes, so from Uber. So Manu uh, has been at Uber for, <laughs> um, for a few months now. Uh, before that, he was at Samsung Research. And before that, uh, we were actually together at IBM Research in, in New York. So he got his uh, PhD from University of California, Berkeley, and the undergrad uh, at MIT. So Manu has worked on uh, a lot of, uh, over the years, he's worked on uh, many techniques for program analysis, especially static program analysis, uh, contributions in uh, CFL reachability, uh, in the WALA framework that, that's been used by various groups. And in general, I mean, he's, wor he's worked on uh, analysis that actually works. So uh, go ahead and tell us more. Uh, thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, can people hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Uh, so thanks. Uh, I've only been at Uber, well, it's been, actually, the time's been flying. I guess it's been almost a year now. Um, but yeah, so I think this is going to be very light on technical depth compared to some of the other amazing talks I've heard here. Um, but maybe that's good for an after lunch talk on the second day. So I'm going to be talking about some work that we've done, some work that's in progress, and some work that's just in the imagination stages. We're kind of just getting started, but I think there's a lot of great opportunity. So I'm going to try to give you an overview of the kind of stuff we're going to try to do also. Um, <clears throat> but first, let's just start out with the, the basics of you know what, what is Uber. I don't think even before I started, I had a really good idea, particularly on the mobile side, of like how many apps and how much code is involved. So the Uber service, uh, the core sort of ride-sharing service, has a couple of different apps. The Rider app, right? That's what you probably all use to book a ride. We've got a separate app for drivers. And then <clears throat> uh, building on the infrastructure, uh, there are more and more apps coming out now. So there's Uber Eats for food delivery. Uh, there's a new freight app. And uh, thus far, all of these apps have pretty much separate code bases on iOS and Android. So there's some shared code, but most of it is pure native apps. So this kind of adds up. There's a pretty significant set of, uh, of uh, mobile applications, quite a bit of code. Uh, and one thing that is not unique to Uber, but I think uh, is, is sort of greater at Uber at some other companies, is the focus on reliability. And there's some good reasons for it. So I mean, if, if the app is crashing, I mean, our, our service is just broken. And this has real world consequences like, so if the, if the rider app is crashing, I mean, you might just be stuck somewhere for a while. Or if the driver app is crashing, that means someone who was planning on driving for a while can't earn. Uh, unlike other apps, almost always when you open up the Uber app, it involves like real money out of your pocket. So again, increased expectation that things are actually working. Uh, and a final point here is that <clears throat> at least by modern software timescales, apps can take a significant amount of time to patch, right? So if you've got some problem in a server-side code, once you find out and you know the fix, you can deploy it almost immediately. But with apps, you've got an app store review process. You've got people who need to actually go and manually update the apps on their phone. So this can take on the order of weeks. And again, if we've got a significant crashing bug, uh, you, know, you might just lose that person. They might not use Uber anymore. It just might be too frustrating. Um, and if you look at the <clears throat> sort of the mission statement of the company, uh, I kind of like the fact that you know the word reliability or the idea of reliability is is right there. So it's it's really really important. Uh, on the flip side of things, like you know any other <laughs> Silicon Valley company these days, I mean uh, Uber wants to move fast, right? So in particular on the mobile apps, there are hundreds of developers working simultaneously. On, on different features, pushing you know, hundreds of commits per day on these apps. Uh, I measured, and it's, it's well into the millions of lines of code if you add up across iOS and Android. So <clears throat> whatever kind of tooling, static analysis, dynamic analysis that we build, we want to enable people to still be very productive. So we want them to be able to stay in their flow. We don't want them to have to like context switch significantly in order to triage tool results, avoid that as much as possible. And also, it's really important when you have this many developers that they can work independently, that they're not constantly stepping on each other's toes, uh, trying to work on the same app. So this is kind of a key question that, that I've been thinking about. What kind of tools can we build 
to sort of enable Uber to, to move fast and keep the reliability of the apps and services high. And thus far, I think the theme that has really emerged, which maybe won't be too surprising to, to people in this room, <clears throat> is that modularity is really the key to this. Modularity in how the apps are designed and analyses that leverage this modularity. So uh, I'm gonna talk about this in detail, but uh, the, the, the architects of the mobile apps at Uber have come up with some nice design principles that emphasize modularity. Uh, and their goals here were again that, that these sort of features can be not only developed independently, but also to improve reliability, they can be disabled independently. Uh, and with this design, developers can continue to move fast to experiment quickly, but without compromising the reliability of the whole app. So what I've been thinking about is how can we fit program analysis into this picture? How can we both enforce the, modu the modularity of these application architectures uh, and also leverage it to make the analysis better, right? Because if you've got modular code, hopefully you can reason in your analysis about the different modules separately and thereby get more precise results and actually scale better. Um, so one thing that's been really kind of refreshing and new to me at Uber compared to my previous experience is that there's a very strong willingness for people who are architecting and designing the app to actually adjust the design to add annotations to the code in order to help analysis. So before, say, <clears throat> when I was working on, say, commercial analyses at, at IBM or Samsung, sort of the code that people write is just like a fixed thing that you have to deal with. And so whatever craziness is in there, you need to modify your program analysis to make it work and do the best you can. So here, when there's the opportunity to change the application architecture to annotate certain properties, it really just makes an enormous difference in terms of like the effectiveness and elegance of the kind of stuff you can put together. So uh, in the rest of this talk, first I'm gonna go into a little bit detail on the mobile application architecture, how uh, it's been designed for modularity and hopefully for analyzability. Then I'm gonna do a couple of case studies which haven't really deeply, I think, leveraged the architecture yet, but they do leverage the fact that people are willing to add annotations in order to do a good job attacking a couple of uh, reliability problems. And finally, uh, if I have time, I'll briefly mention some, some future projects and, and open problems that we're working on. And uh, uh, please ask questions at, at any point. <clears throat> So let me start with uh, designing for an analyzability and start with uh, sort of some stuff that happened before uh, I got to Uber in 2016. They made a decision that they were gonna rewrite both the writer apps for iOS and for Android, just rewrite them from scratch, which to me sounds, I don't know, kind of crazy, but I guess I haven't looked at the old writer app code, so <laughs> it may well have been the right decision. Um, but when they did this, they also designed a new mobile application architecture with some key goals. Uh, one of them was high availability of the core flows, sort of the core experience of being able to book a ride and get somewhere. Um, keep that very reliable, but let people build other features, experiment with other things without compromising that. And also, they wanted to decouple features uh, as much as possible. I think that probably in the previous app, there's a whole bunch of spaghetti around people just hacking things on passing state around without any constraints. So they really wanted to decouple features as much as possible. And <clears throat> um, I think apart from their inherent benefits for architecting the app, I think that these goals will eventually help us a lot in some of the static analysis that, that, that we might wanna do. So let me get more concrete with a couple of examples here. So first, um, I thought it was quite interesting that there's a plugin architecture on, on the mobile applications, uh, the writer app in particular. So the motivation, again, is to isolate the core flows from other sort of less critical features, right? So a core flow would be being able to get a ride, but non-core would be to update your billing address in your account settings, right? If that has a bug in it that we shipped and it's causing crashes, that shouldn't compromise people's ability to be able to actually just book their rides. <clears throat> and a key thing about these plugins that enables that is that they can be disabled remotely. Um, so we have uh, a whole system of being able to use server-side flags in the code, uh, both for experimentation, but also for this kind of reliability. So every time the app 
starts up, we download the latest flag values, and if the flag says, oh, shut these features off, they're crashing too much, then they just won't turn on. And this reduces the risk in terms of being able to experiment with new features, right? We don't need to uniformly vet every single line of code under the assumption that it might compromise everything about the app. We know that for some things, if they're not working, uh, we can just turn them off if need be without having to ship a new app to users. So in a bit, uh, well, let me show you some examples. So this is the, the main screen of the Uber Rider app, and all of this stuff in boxes is built via plugins. So change your profile, scheduled rides, location shortcuts, all of this stuff, if need be, can be disabled on the server side if it's causing problems with the, with the reliability of the app. Under the hood, uh, basically the core code defines certain plugin points where people can extend uh, the, the app with new features. If you make changes to core code, that flags uh, additional manual review from sort of core committers because that code is you know, not in a plugin, so it can't be turned off. Uh, and they have you know, a very basic lintic analysis, but it ensures that when you have core code, it can only reference this non-core code, these non-critical features via this plugin mechanism. And this is just done via a naming convention and linting to look at module dependencies <clears throat> and even uh, you know, import level dependencies in Java code. But you know, it works. And I thought it was quite effective in that 80% of the code in the Rider app is actually inside these plugins. So <clears throat> a lot of it uh, is, has this extra level of robustness in terms of being able to be remotely disabled. And on every single commit, there are automated tests that disable all the plugins and make sure that the core flows are still working as expected. So this is one interesting feature. Uh, another one that's around state management in the app is uh, what's called deep scope hierarchies. So there's a lot of shared state in the mobile app, kind of necessarily, because different features need to know about certain common things. So the map and the map state is one obvious thing, right? That many different features are going to have to know what's on the map and what, what's being displayed there. But there's also stuff like when you're logged in, the user account information is going to have to be shared uh, among many different features. So the key question here is, is where do you put this stuff? And I think the solution in the old writer app is let's put it was let's put it in the global state. And I think we all know that that can lead to a lot of serious problems. Uh, you get all kinds of subtle dependencies creeping in between features because there's there's no there's no control around it, right? Everyone can just willy nilly go access anything that they want. Uh, never mind when you have concurrency. What kind of bugs can can creep up here? Uh, another key point uh, uh, for our driver app in particular is that we want to be able to manage object lifetimes very carefully uh, to avoid leaks. So with a typical mobile app, you know, you might open it up, do a couple things, and then switch over to something else. But the driver app is one of these apps that actually just sit, sits open potentially for hours. And leaks can lead to crashes. And if it's at an inopportune moment, you know, you miss a turn or you don't get to book a ride, we'd really like to minimize leaks in the driver app. So, after some interaction is done, like after a trip is complete, you'd like to know that you've promptly discarded all the state that's associated with that trip and you're not leaking it. And in the old app, this was extremely fragile, just sort of manually written reset methods on objects. You had to go null out global static fields. It was, it was a mess. So these deep hi scope hierarchies are kind of, I think, like region-based memory management, but you know, without any language support. It's just an architecture. Um, but it, it works quite well. So let me just illustrate it with an example. So you have these scopes. So like a root scope would be where any globally uh, visible state would go. And that should be kind of minimized. And then different child scopes are created depending on the state of the app. So initially, you're logged out. And there's a logged out scope that maybe contains all the state around signing up for a new account or logging in. Once you're logged in, you transition so the logged out scope is no longer uh, valid. You're in a logged in kind of state right now. And the idea is that <clears throat> when you do this transition, all, all the state relevant to being logged out just gets cleaned up. It should all be unreachable. We've got a garbage collected language, so we'll just rely on the garbage collector to clean that up. And then you've got further nesting, right? So now once you're logged in, you might want to make a request. You've got state associated with that. Once you make a request, 
you'll be on the trip. You've got different state associated with that. And these transitions, again, uh, should clean up all the relevant state. And you also know from the structure, sort of, when you have a new piece of state, you know you have a good idea of where it should live. It's not just stash it in the global state somewhere. So un under the hood, how does this work? So the parent is responsible for creating and destroying these child scopes. And state sharing is explicit. So even from parent to child, you have to be explicit and pass down any state that you want visible to your children. And you're statically prohibited from accessing sibling state. This is just by the Java type system. You can't do it. Uh, it's not visible at all. <clears throat> and object lifetimes are tied to these scopes. right? So when you transition, if you've done things correctly, then all the relevant state should become unreachable, and this should help prevent memory leaks. There's no more manual futzing with reset methods here. And this is all based on a, a new framework. It's called a RIB framework, which I think uh, we plan to open source soon. And the, the details aren't important. This is um, uh, basically a refinement of model view controller. And the refinement is primarily around managing the state, st state sharing and how you transition uh, between these states. So this is, uh, I mean, you know, there's a lot of architecture here uh, around the app. You know, what, what, what are the implications? Um, so in terms of being able to move fast, uh, <clears throat> this, this, this has been very helpful. I think this is part of the reason they were actually able to rebuild the writer app uh, so quickly is because of this architectures. So features uh, tend to stay independent, right, with this structure. And this is actually not so easy because, like I said, there's so much state that needs to be shared in the app between different features. You have well-defined contracts. So the, the tree structure of the scopes <clears throat> tell you what state is being shared from your parent, what state you're sharing with your, with your, with your children. It's all explicit. And also, uh, between the core code and the optional code, they're not just arbitrarily calling into each other. You have these plug-in points that define how they can interact. And so this really helps developers who are working on independent features to, to keep their sanity because they've got these contracts that help them know uh, help them know how to interact with other features, and they know that other people won't randomly be touching their code. Now, I think that the structure could benefit program analysis in many ways, too. And this is sort of largely on the drawing board, but I, I think there's a lot of potential here. So one, I think that <clears throat> because much of this application structure is uh, defined basically by the type system, um, whole program analysis just out of the box will work better because you'll have less pollution from imprecise data flow, that if you didn't have this kind of architecture, uh, you know, there might be imprecisions in the analysis that tend to cascade because there's no kind of type system enforcement of isolation. I also think that there's, there's, there's good potential here for modularly verifying certain properties. Uh, so first, if you want to reason about the core code, and this is what I've been mostly thinking about, hopefully you can reason that all the 80% of code in plugins is pretty much irrelevant to these properties. Uh, you need some contracts around what the plugins are actually doing, but that's the hope, right? That you can ignore much of the application code and try to ve verify some key properties about the core, which is most important. And similarly, since these deep scopes restrict how shade is shared between different features, you can hope if there's a particular feature and we care a lot about a property of that feature, that we could, again, verify it without uh, having to explicitly analyze a bunch of the other code in the app. Now, of course, we're going to need specifications at all these different boundaries, and I think one problem that we'll have to look at is can we infer them, or maybe we can get developers to write them depending on how complicated they are. But I think there's a, there's a big opportunity here to take kind of a lot of the techniques that we know about from you know, precise program analysis and take them along with understanding of this application architecture uh, and prove some pretty, pretty interesting properties uh, about this code. So like I said, <clears throat> sort of the deeper analysis is all kind of a, kind of a work in progress, but this is the kind of stuff that, that we're thinking about. Um, so any questions at this point? Okay, so let me go into uh, a couple case studies on, on things that we've done or uh, are, are in progress. Um, and the first is on doing nullness checking for our Android code, so trying to prevent uh, null pointer exceptions. So first let me tell you about some of the, the principles for bug checkers that we've found <clears throat> uh, 
uh, to be uh, to, to, to work well within the sort of developer uh, workflow at, at Uber. So that one, and this is different than, than a lot of companies, is that we want to build checkers that essentially block the build. If you've got violations, you need to fix them, or you can't merge your code back. So in, in many other systems, uh, you'll have warnings that say feed into the code review process, and code reviewers can look at them and decide what to do. We found that people tend not to address them, particularly when they're trying to get stuff shipped quickly. So we want to uh, have this basically be like a type checker. Like your, your code just doesn't compile if, if, uh, <clears throat> if, if we find bugs. So this means that precision is really critical and also understandability is really critical. Um, we also want to run checks as early as possible. The ideal would be to just you know, get instant feedback in your IDE as you're coding. We're not quite there yet. But the earlier, the better. And this is in terms of not making developers look at a bunch of reports from a tool sort of after they've moved on to working on a different piece of code. So here, performance is, is really critical. We want to have fast running tools. And the final thing, which I kind of mentioned before, is requiring annotations is actually OK. Um, again, if, if the value proposition is right, if we can deal properly with a class of bugs that are causing a lot of problems in the app, then the developers are open to you know, lightweight annotations, but adding annotations nonetheless to make the tool work. And this is really great because we can make the errors more understandable uh, leveraging these annot uh, annotations and also make the analyses run faster. So with that background, let's talk a little bit about null pointer exceptions. Anyone who's coded in Java is familiar with stacks like these. I think I took this from Walla, actually. But, uh, on Android, this is uh, a major source of crashes. And I think this is true for pretty much everybody, but it was certainly true for the Uber apps. So in 2015, uh, Facebook released uh, Infer, right, their framework for uh, deep static analysis, which was heavily focused uh, on, on Android. Uh, and it had nice functionality for static detection of potential null pointer exceptions. Uh, and Uber actually adopted Infer very aggressively to try to eradicate null pointer exceptions in, in the code. And by aggressively, uh, I mean that I, I think Uber actually runs these tools in, in a, a more strict mode than even Facebook does in terms of, again, if you have warnings, you can't merge your code back. It just blocks. So I thought that was, uh, that was quite interesting. And I, I put eradicate in quotes here because there's actually a tool within Infer called Eradicate, which takes a type-based approach to preventing null pointer exceptions. So let me just quickly go through uh, uh, how this works. So <clears throat> um, with a type-based approach, basically you need to annotate whenever a return value or a method parameter or a field might be null. Otherwise, the tool will assume it can never be null and it will report errors when you try to pass null or assign null to those locations. So here, We've got a logging function that just prints out the value as parameter, and here we're calling it with the null value. So in this type-based approach, you'll immediately get an error saying you can't pass null here because that's a non-null parameter. That's what we assume. We can address that message by saying, OK, well, fine. Let's make it nullable. We'll add an annotation there. But now we'll get an error at this dereference, this method invocation, saying, OK, you're dereferencing something nullable. This might need to an exception. And you can finally fix this by adding a null check. And now we know this can't be null at this point, so the tool says, fine, this code is, is good. So it's not doing whole program data flow to track null values to dereferences. It's a modular analysis based on these annotations. And Checker Framework, I think, is probably the first widely deployed tool from University of Washington that did this kind of checking. And Eradicate was the version that was being used um, at Uber. So, uh, Eradicate actually worked amazingly well for improving the reliability of the app. Uh, I don't have numbers, but I think the number of null pointer crashes in the field was just dramatically reduced. Uh, the only problem was that it actually took a significant amount of time to run. Uh, it was long enough that developers generally wouldn't run this tool locally, uh, and it was so not something we could force them to do. Um, in fact, given uh, our, our machine resources in continuous integration and how many changes people were submitting to the apps. 
The only feasible way we could run it automatically is on a thing called the submit queue. So let me just briefly say, you, you write code at Uber, and then you put it up for code review, and it goes through the review, and once everything is approved and those checks are passed, there's a final stage before you commit your code called the submit queue. The reason being that we have a lot of concurrent changes going on, and we want to check that for the final commit order, uh, that when you commit this code on the latest version of master, that all the tests are still passing. So it was only at that final stage that they were running uh, eradicate to check for these null pointer exceptions. And so this can lead to a very frustrating experience for developers, right? You make your change, get through the review, and then potentially hours later, you say, sorry, we can't merge this. You've got to fix this null pointer warning. So what I did was I basically rebuilt something very similar, but using this framework from Google called error prone. And what it lets you do is it lets you build custom checks and plug them directly into the Java compiler. And this makes things run very quickly because you can reuse a bunch of work that the compiler has already done, like parsing the code into an AST, like doing type analysis. And uh, on top of that, um, that, that actually saves a surprising amount of time. So we built this tool called Nullaway, which does very similar checking to what I've shown, but as a plug-in to error prone. So now we can run this tool on every single build of the code, including builds on local laptops, rather than just on the, on the submit queue. The overhead is under 10%, which uh, is, you know, it's not zero, it's significant, but for us it's worthwhile, given that we want to block on these errors. So dev developers get much faster feedback. Um, I'm not going to get into details on this, but this actually did find hundreds of new issues uh, in our code base also. So I think that this hit kind of a sweet spot in terms of if you're willing to annotate your code, this is probably the, the best way to get rid of null pointer exceptions for the most part, and I'll get to that in the next slide, without compromising your build speeds too much. And this was recently released as open source, so you can uh, grab it off of GitHub. So what about soundness? Is it a type? Oh, yeah, question. Can you just put 10% of what? 10% of what? Uh, so compiling your code takes, oh, okay, like, okay. yeah. So it runs on any time you're running the okay. Java compiler, and now it's a bit slower because we're doing this checking inside the compiler. So, so what about soundness? So this analysis is not sound. It's, it's not even soundy. Um, if you're familiar, if you're familiar with that, and I think this is the key contrast with uh, the checking that's available in the Checker framework. So they've got a fairly sophisticated analysis and set of type annotations to really try to completely soundly eliminate as much as possible null pointer exceptions. Uh, our system, like Eradicate, has all kinds of holes around multi-threading, around initialization, arrays. I mean, I can't even list them all. But what we do is I try to keep an eye on if and when we have any crashes in the field, kind of like what's going on there, is there a hole that we can plug? And in practice, actually, the gap hasn't been about a lot of these you know, <clears throat> less commonly used language features, but about third-party libraries, where we'll pass in some value, and then three or four levels down, it'll dereference a null pointer, but we don't have the specification. So I think uh, we have some ideas, and there's been some work in the literature around kind of inferring for these third-party libraries the right annotations at the boundaries so that we can do better checking in our code. And that's what I think would have the most impact in terms of really getting the rest of the exceptions eliminated. Uh, final point is that uh, with these mobile apps, often you're dealing with data that comes in either from disk or over the network, uh, and then you turn it into a data structure, and you have certain assumptions about what fields are present or not present which sort of reflected as nullability. And we have a tool called Rave, which is also open source, which if you have these nullability annotations in your code, will at runtime validate that, say, this field is actually present in this network response. Um, and if it's not, you, you can have customized uh, solutions for uh, logging that and responding to it without actually just crashing with a null pointer exception uh, somewhere else in your code. Um, so one recent enhancement that I think has been fun uh, and, and kind of fits a general theme is around uh, handling of streams. So in Java 8, there are these uh, streams and lambdas, and they're getting used more and more in real-world code, and I think it brings up some, some interesting challenges uh, for these types of analyses. So <clears throat> this is a simple example. 
you've got a data class, which I don't know, has an age method in it, and then a person has some data associated, but it might be null, okay? Now let's say we have a stream of, of these uh, person objects and we want to sum their ages. So we might take the stream and then run a filter operation that says only keep the person objects where the data is not null and then map each person to their age and take the sum, right? And so now the problem is if you run our tool, at least the older version of it, you'd get an error here saying, okay, well, the data method of, of uh, the person is null and you're not doing an null check here. So this might yield a null pointer exception. But looking at this code, you know it's safe, right? Because we've already filtered out any person object um, that has null data. So this actually comes up a lot in our code base and was one of the main causes of just suppressing warnings from our checker. So we've actually enhanced it. You can think of it as being able to have custom handling of these kind of filter operations. So now uh, our tool can figure out that this is, after this filter operation, this is actually a stream of person objects where we know that their data is not null, basically. Uh, and now we don't, we don't give any warnings uh, for this kind of code. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting enhancement and I think that, you know, well, I'll talk about it in, in the next topic, but I think that this is an interesting area for research is kind of adapting analyses and tools to these kind of stream APIs because uh, it doesn't just work out of the box in my experience. Some, some custom understanding of their semantics uh, really goes a long way in making tools more practical. So that leads into the next topic, the next tool that we've been working on, which is around multi-threading. So we all know that <clears throat> when you have multi-threading in your code that many kinds of nasty bugs are, are possible. So things like data races, of course, and also in mobile apps, there are bugs where you have to perform certain operations on the main thread, in particular, updating the UI. If you do it off the main thread, you'll either just crash, or even worse, I think on iOS, it's just undefined behavior, and you're not really sure what's gonna happen. So the interesting thing, and this is part of that mobile architecture that they kind of redefined in 2016, is that almost all the multi-threading, at least on our Android code, is done via this ReactiveX library. And what this library gives you is essentially uh, functional reactive programming for asynchronous streams. So this is how we abstract uh, like data coming in over the network or user taps on the screen. Much, much of the sort of outside inputs to the app are abstracted via this ReactiveX library. And the interesting thing is that there's a very structured use of threads that comes along with this library. So this is just a small code example where the streams are called observables in this library. So we have some source observable, like a stream of data, and if you want to do some expensive computation on every value, uh, what you can do is say, okay, let's observe on the computation uh, thread pool. So this means that subsequent operations should run on a computation thread. So now we do our expensive operation, uh, and then if we want to display the results back in the UI, you need to write observe on main to make sure that this uh, UI affecting code uh, is running on the main thread. So a lot of our code around multi-threading, like all the multi-threading is due to these kind of observe on calls. So this is an opportunity uh, for doing specialized analysis uh, to try to check for, for problematic code. So we've built a tool that thus far we're calling the Rx thread checker. Um, and let me just illustrate uh, so right now it's focused on these UI off the main thread uh, kind of errors. So in this code, we have an off main thread UI access, right? Because uh, I took away that observe on main call. So here we're saying shift to the computation thread, but then this display routine is updating the UI. So let me just walk through uh, how this tool um, actually checks uh, for these errors. And it's in a very type-based manner. So first, uh, we assume and check that any method that's touching the UI is annotated with this UI effect annotation, okay? And it happens if you're either directly touching the UI or transitively via some callee. So we have, this, we have to annotate this display method, and then for lambdas, we do some pretty simple inference so that you don't have to write annotations all over your lambda. We infer that this lambda is UI effect. And we actually do this with an existing uh, effect analysis. This was work that uh, Colin Gordon and others uh, wrote about in ecoop 13 and 
their, their checker is just available and we were able to reuse it pretty much out of the box. So now we know what code is touching the UI. The next thing we need to do is reason about uh, these streams, these observables, and what thread the operations are executing on. And for this, we essentially defined uh, a thread type system for these observables and implemented it using the checker framework. So in this example, let's assume that the source observable is, is running on the main thread. We can write in type definitions very, very easily uh, how these subsequent operations affect the thread of the stream. So when you observe on the computation thread, uh, our typing rules say, OK, the resulting observable is on the compute thread. And then this map, option, map operation has no effect on the thread, along with most of these uh, streaming operators. So this is very easy to express as just a polymorphic type that says whatever the type of the receiver observable is should also be the type that's returned. So now we know that, OK, this, sub, this callback has a UI effect. and uh, the, the, the stream that's coming in is on the compute thread, so we can just write a simple check that reports an error here. You're, you have a UI effect off of the main thread. So again, it's a pretty simple analysis. It's all modular and scalable, enabled by the fact that we were able to convince developers that they should add these UI effect annotations uh, to the code. And these, these thread annotations, almost always we can infer the right, the right case, so they don't really need to worry about that too much. So we're currently actively deploying this checker across our Android code base. Uh, it's already found like tens of issues in the apps. And what I'd like to do in future work is actually extend this uh, type of checking uh, to side effect freedom, right? When you think about these kind of stream computations, they really shouldn't be doing random side effects all over the place. They should be mostly you know, purely functional code operating on values, and if we can enforce that there aren't side effects in the wrong places, um, that should help control any data races in the code. And what we really want to do is, is, is right now, when people write this code, they're actually kind of afraid to move computations to background threads because they don't know if they're going to cause some horrible data race that's only going to show up in production. So we actually think that with better static checking, we can actually improve the performance of the app a lot by letting people move work off the main thread uh, more aggressively. OK, so I have a few minutes left. Let me briefly talk about some other projects and, uh, and open problems that we're starting to ramp up on. So a big one is, is performance. So this is uh, a Micromax Spark uh, Android phone. Uh, it's uh, a phone for sale in India, and it costs about $100. So you know, it's great that these phones are affordable, but as you can imagine, the hardware is not really comparable to a high-end you know, iPhone or Samsung, right? In particular, they tend to have less memory, and also actually the quality of the flash storage is much lower, and this really has a negative impact on performance. Um, we want our app to run smoothly on you know, all the devices that people are using. In particular, um, there's a lot of these low-end devices in the big growth markets like Latin America and India. So and this is actually an open question that we're still thinking about. What's the best way to attack these kind of performance problems with, with program analysis, static or dynamic? Uh, some ideas would be, so we already have this checker right around this reactive framework that knows what thread uh, different computations are running on. So if we know that certain computations are very expensive, we should be able to build a static check saying, make sure you push this to a background thread before you call this function. Um, we'd like to give better visibility into uh, UI blocking network requests, right? So <clears throat> some, sometimes when you're hitting the network in the app, it's just to send up some analytics data, right? But sometimes you're actually retrieving data that's important because the user can't move on to the next step. So if we can do analysis that sort of distinguishes these different types of network requests, then even at the networking layer, there might be optimizations that can be done to prioritize things in a, in a better way. Uh, we'd really like to reduce crashes due to memory leaks and out of memory errors. And one idea here is <clears throat> try, trying to statically enforce the kind of state encapsulation that is being done kind of informally with those scope hierarchies that I showed you before. So I think with static enforcement, we might be able to catch bad practices where people are kind of going outside of that scope tree and leaking state. 
So that's another opportunity here. Um, but the big challenge is, again, people want to move fast. We've got tens or hundreds of developers constantly pushing in new features and you know, enforcing performance constraints in, in the face of you know, constantly changing codes is just a very hard problem. So we're going to have to really sort of you know, find the right, right points at which to enforce this, whether it's statically or maybe, maybe with dynamic analysis also. Another interesting um, sort of problem space that we're just starting to look at is the Swift programming language. So this is a new language defined by Apple. It's supposed to be the future of development on iOS. And Uber has already invested quite heavily in building code in Swift. So that new rider app on iOS was written pretty much entirely with Swift. If you Google Swift with 100 engineers, you can see a talk that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the core architects of that app gave on it. Uh, and one interesting thing here is that the architecture of using plugins and deep scope and this reactive X library is all there on iOS too. So there's real potential if we have good ideas for analysis to try to apply the same ideas on both platforms. The problem is that there's very little analysis infrastructure available for Swift. And there's a good reason for this, which is that you know, the language is constantly changing and there's not really anything like a language spec per se. Like, I don't expect there to be any independent implementation outside of Apple's. So basically, the compiler defines <laughs> what's going on here. And uh, that makes it hard to build you know, independent infrastructure. You, you want to sort of stay on the latest and greatest version. At the same time, you don't want to be dependent on every little detail of the compiler. So this is still something we're thinking about. We did release a tool called Neil, which we've been using to at least lint Swift code. So we built our own parser for Swift, and this has been actually quite useful for at least defining high-level linting rules uh, around, the new, uh, around Swift code. But I think <clears throat> there's a lot more work to be done here. Swift is a pretty complicated language with an interesting combination of like modern high-level features and low-level features, I guess kind of like Rust. Uh, so I think there'll be interesting challenges even in adopting standard static analysis techniques to, to handle those constructs. So, this is another area that's wide open that we're just kind of ramping up on. And uh, I think, I don't know, there's, there's just a whole bunch of particular things we could do. Uh, verification of startup code. This is like within that core code, we have certain modules that are sort of very critical to app startup and modules that actually do crash recovery. So sometimes crashes happen due to corruption, say, of state on disk. And we have code that tries to detect if there's repeated crashes due to corrupted state, that at some point, it'll just wipe out all the state on your phone and just start from scratch so that the app doesn't get permanently stuck. And the question is, what if there's a bug in the crash recovery code? Uh, there's certain code that like, we just would really want high assurance, like certain critical libraries, and I think could justify you know, more heavyweight verification techniques. Uh, code duplication. People are copy-pasting code like left and right. And not only is this, you know, perhaps not the best software engineering practice, but it actually bloats the size of the app too, right? Which affects like the size of downloads, the size on disk, which is, is a big deal for mobile apps, more so than say server-side code. I think there's a lot of work to be done on test generation and also test selection, right? So every time you put up a change to the code, we need to run a whole bunch of tests to make sure it's not broken. If we have better smarts around what tests really need to be run, what tests are very unlikely to be broken by your change, that could help developer productivity a lot because they could get their changes through quicker. Uh, I think dead code elimination is kind of in a similar vein as preventing code duplication. We want to get rid of any unnecessary code in the app in order to, to reduce uh, download size, on disk size, and all these kind of things. Uh, and we're just starting to think about also analyses. I mean, we have got a whole bunch of server side code too, right? Um, distributed systems, uh, complicated to reason about, and we're just starting to think about dynamic static analyses uh, on that side. So that's, uh, that's it. Uh, in conclusion, you know, we're trying to build tools that help us maintain the very high level of reliability that we need, but without getting in developers' ways too much. And <clears throat> modularity, both in design of the code and the analysis, I think, is the key to really hitting that sweet spot. So uh, I'll be sharing the slides. You don't need to like jot this down, but there's a bunch of blog posts if you're interested on the application architecture. Um, <clears throat> and we've got a couple of tools uh, in open source. 
And uh, yeah, as of recently, we actually have a group now. So this is the Uber uh, programming systems group. Some people have started uh, very recently. Uh, Benno was our intern over the summer. He built a lot of the, uh, of the RX thread checker. And uh, we're continuing to grow. Interns, uh, anyone who's interested, please put them uh, uh, in touch with me. So yeah, thanks, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Questions? Uh, it seems that you're in a unique position to, to do um, case, uh, no, usability studies for formal methods with developers, right? I guess the scientific community would be very grateful to learn which kind of annotations are easy for programmers, which are not. There's now in the usability study community a push towards uh, usability for developers, and that might be quite relevant. So it seems that the position in which you are might be very helpful for that. Yeah, that's a really good point. So I think most of the annotations we've been asking developers to write thus far are, are quite shallow. I mean, compared to, say, writing loop invariants. I mean, this is super easy. So I think there's a very interesting question of, you know, how far can we push it <laughs> before we start getting pushback? And there will be a limit. So that's, that's a really good point. It's something that we should think about writing about um, as, as we go forward. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think that no one's going to be ha happy <laughs> about writing extra annotations. I mean, most of the time, they, they want to just get their job done. But that's, I, I think this, the, to, to sell it to developers, you have to sort of look at the whole kind of, get them to have a global view of like, look, you write this annotation now, it's kind of a pain, but imagine if you're on call, and we start having an application crash after a launch at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're the one running into the office to try to fix this thing. Um, so I, I think it's, you have to be careful in how you phrase that question. If you just ask, were you happy writing this annotation in the IDE, I really doubt many people are going to say, yeah, that was awesome. But, uh, <laughs> no, but there are people that uh, do it professionally. They know how to phrase the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not one of those people, so we'd have to collaborate in order to and to figure that out. Okay, more questions? Somebody else? So somewhere in the talk, you, you mentioned uh, bringing analysis uh, closer to the developer. Uh, best time would be in the IDE. Yeah. But then you didn't touch on that. Uh, can you talk about your experiences of, of trying to integrate any of these analysis uh, in the IDE? What are the issues or the problems? Right. Um, so, I mean, you, you really need to, I, I think that, you know, mo mo the modularity is absolutely essential. You want to be able to analyze even a file at a time in the IDE, and also you need to be, just keep a lot of incremental state. So, we, so to answer the first question, we haven't dug into this deeply yet, um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that that's another place where, being able to do modular analysis is really important, and so it's perhaps uh, a selling point, again, for getting people to write more annotations, is that we can give you the feedback that much faster, even within a single file, uh, if we can reason within that file based on your annotations about the properties we're trying to reason about. So that's, I know, it's very kind of hand-wavy, but I think that's, uh, that's what's going to help us as we push towards, towards deeper uh, IDE integration, but it's definitely you know future work. We haven't dug into it deeply yet. So in some other areas, say operating systems, uh, there are there are of course parts like applications where people they're basically disposable, and then there is the core that must be super super <laughs> secure. And now it's even like research is starting to get to get it verified. Yeah. So do you think that the Uber app will also go this way, and there will be some core and then there will be sandboxed features in <laughs> JavaScript. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I think, yeah, already with the plugins, there's a sort of very limited amount of, of sandboxing there. And I definitely do see a trend toward that. I mean, if you look at the, the, the kind of the most significant, like, major outages that we've had in the mobile app, like, 
almost always it's a problem in the core code, right? Because the other things we can shut off quickly, but when there's some subtle bug like in crash recovery or in like, I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, the plugin flags get downloaded at startup. So there's a library that manages these flags. And if there's a bug in there, um, it's, it's really hard to recover from. So I think like more verification of that kind of code is justified. Whether we really need to strictly sandbox the other stuff, I think maybe not so much, particularly because we're not letting like third party developers run a plugin inside our app, right? With operating systems, even with browsers, you have this issue of untrusted code. And at least at this point, we're not quite there in terms of having to deal with other people's code and run it within our app. So maybe we don't need such a strict sandbox, but more deep verification of the core code, I think, is definitely something that would pay off. OK, one more. Um, so I guess one of the obvious questions is precision. OK. Um, how, like, what kind of precision do you get, and what kind of influence this has on the develop on developers and like their acceptance of the system. Right, so the, the nice thing about uh, the type-based approaches that we've been taking is that, you know, you're not checking, you're not trying to say, yeah, here's a trace through the program that causes a crash. There's a typing discipline and all you're checking is, you know, have they violated the typing discipline or not? So even if it's sort of a false positive, in the sense that, uh, okay, yeah, this code will actually never crash if you look at it globally. The, the fact that they can understand sort of that there's a local property that's being checked and the, the fix is fairly obvious usually, I think helps us a lot. So um, the way we look at it is like, you know, finding, at least thus far, it's like sort of trying to find a way to leverage annotations to check simple, local, and understandable properties. And then these questions about sort of global precision and whether some behavior is feasible kind of become become less important. That's what's happened thus far. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, let's thank Mano again. <laughs>